Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Paul Polak. Uh, Paul was born in Czechoslovakia, and uh, when things became difficult for Jewish people in Europe, Paul's parents decided to escape to Canada, uh, where he grew up to be a psychiatrist. Uh, he also inherited a love of tinkering from his father, and in fact, he was the inventor of a pump jack for the oil field industry, which he did in his spare time. Now, Paul likes to combine radically affordable technology with radically decentralized supply chains to serve the bottom billion customers. He introduced a treadle pump in Bangladesh that allows farmers to pump groundwater in the dry season. And then, uh, in order to uh, sell the pump, he promoted a Bollywood, Bollywood movie uh, which uh, uh, sort of encouraged people to buy this pump. And he ended up selling two million of these pumps. Paul is currently working on another project to sell affordable drinking water in uh, rural Indian villages. Uh, Paul has been recognized by the Scientific American as one of the world's leading 50 contributors to science. He was also named by Atlantic Monthly as one of the world's brave thinkers, along with Barack Obama, Steve Jobs, and 26 others, for being willing to risk careers, reputations, and fortunes to advance ideas that upend an established order. Paul? Uh, I'm sure all of our colleagues are eager to hear your words. <clears throat> Yesterday you heard an inspiring story of a man who lost his legs uh, as a child and developed transformative new technologies that allow him now to walk normally. Today I'm going to talk to you about equally transformative technologies, but technologies for the polar opposite end of the economic spectrum. Technologies like the Jaipur foot developed here in India, in which a farm laborer walks in on crutches in the morning and walks out with a fitted foot at the remarkable cost of $25 or the Remotion Artificial Knee, developed by DREV in Silicon Valley, which has been tested successfully by 3,500 recipients, and that knee has a retail price of $75. I came here today to invite you to dream with me about a Mahindra that rises to meet the future. I dream of a Mahindra 10 years from now that has $100 billion in sales. $40 billion of those sales and $2 billion in bottom line profits could come from creating new businesses, providing health, education, water, and energy to the 2.6 billion customers at the bottom of the pyramid who have been bypassed by current markets. I'd like to begin by talking about sustainability. The first question is, am I sustainable? I'm 78 and still full, full of piss and vinegar, but the accountants tell me I only have 12 years left. Perhaps more relevant is the question, is Mahindra sustainable? You have a remarkable track record in the past 10 years of rising from what was about to be an unlisted company to global sales of $14.4 billion in 
a remarkably diverse group of companies, leadership in such areas as uh, agriculture, uh, farm equipment, financial services, and information software. But in my view, not a single one of uh, Mahindra's current products are affordable enough to be attractive to the 2.6 billion customers in the world who live on less than $2 a day. I'm going to talk to you today about three things. First, why future corporations will need to develop a capacity for transformative innovation in order to survive and a capacity to create new mar markets serving the bottom of the pyramid. Second, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to tell you some stories about my experiences over the past 25 years helping 20 million one acre farmers rise out of poverty. And third, I'm going to talk about how Mahindra could create profitable new markets serving the bypassed 40% of the customers in the world who live on less than $2 a day. Let's start with an example. General Motors was one of the biggest and most powerful corporations in the world and three years ago General Motors was brought to its knees by failing to respond quickly and effectively to competition from Japanese imported cars, which were smaller, cheaper, and more fuel efficient. And here is a current neighborhood in Detroit. This is what it looks like as a result of that failure. Today, Coca-Cola sells what amounts to fizzy sugar water for 10 rupees a bottle in thousands of rural villages across India. In many of those villages, 50% of the children are malnourished. What would happen to Coca-Cola if a well-financed Indian or Chinese company started selling a nutritious form of soda pop for two rupees in villages all over the world. My contention is that Coca-Cola would follow General Motors. Closer to home, three or four million people shop at Big Bazaar in India every day. But not a single person who earns less than $2 a day is a customer in Big Bazaar stores or in your own mother and child stores. Customers like this person. I have personally over the past 25 years interviewed 3,000 of them and walked through their fields. And they've become my teachers and my friends. I believe these can be your future customers where you not only help them rise out of poverty, but earn very attractive profits at scale doing it, 100 million customers at a time. How can Mahindra remain at the forefront of innovation over the next 10 years? and create these transformative technologies and businesses. I believe one of the ways you can do this is by creating vibrant, transformative new markets that serve these 2.6 billion bypass customers, and I'm going to talk about practical ways that you can accomplish that. The opportunities to create new markets serving bottom of the pyramid customers are almost unlimited. There are a billion customers in the world who don't have access to safe drinking water. There are another billion customers in the world who don't have access to electricity and will probably never connect to the electric grid.
My dream is to create four global businesses in water, in energy, in health, and in education. Each of these new businesses will have the potential to reach $10 billion in sales and serve 100 million customers. And I think you can design for this kind of scale from the very beginning in selecting technologies and designing business strategies to reach these customers profitably. Now I'm going to give you a little bit more information about one effort that is now in the late beta testing stage. It's a business that I started called Spring Health. It is providing safe drinking water to people in villages in eastern India um, at 20 paisa a liter. Uh, average family buys 10 liters for two rupees. That's about a third of what they spend on treating the illnesses they get from drinking bad water. We're using a radically affordable water purifying, water purifying technology. Essentially, uh, it uses <coughs> a 5% solution of salt water, runs some electricity through it, and that produces mixed chlorine oxidants so you can chlorify fecally contaminated water. We go into partnership with some of the eight six to eight million Tirana shops in India. They build, we build a 3,000 liter tank next to their shop. They fill it with their own water from their open well, which is usually contaminated with fecal pathogens. We then send our uh, commissioned business associates around to purify that water, test it, and the shopkeeper sells it for 20 paisa a liter. And we have a home delivery service by bicycle to deliver it to people's homes at a little higher price. Here's a little two and a half minute video which will give you an idea of how Usually it contaminated. I'm sorry, it's, what's happened to the video? Oh, here we are. The opening of a water shop is an important ceremony in the life of the village. More and more customers in rural Arissa are buying safe water from their local small shop for four cents a day. They're buying it from small village shopkeepers. Windhorse and Spring Health India partner with the shopkeepers and install a 3,000 liter cement tank next to the shop, which the shopkeeper fills with water from his shallow open well which is usually contaminated with fecal pathogens. A company staff member purifies the water in the tank by adding chlorine and other water purifiers. A central part of the Spring Health rollout strategy is creating a strong, dependable brand identity in small, remote rural villages. A bicycle home delivery service carries jerry cans filled with safe drinking water to customers' homes up to three kilometers from the kiosk at a cost of eight cents for 10 liters compared with four cents at the kiosk. The people in rural villages in Orissa report a rapid drop in diarrhea and they are very happy with the result. Over the next three years we will partner with 10,000 village shops and sell safe drinking water to 5 million people. Over 10 years, that number will increase to 400,000 shops in 20 countries. And with new access to safe drinking water, 200 million rural people will lead more prosperous and healthy lives.
So how does all this apply to Mahindra? As I said before, I believe it's entirely possible to develop profitable businesses serving a hundred million customers at a time who live on less than two dollars a day. I think this is not just a crazy wild-eyed scheme. It's practical and doable and the reason that I say so is my experience over the last 25 years helping uh, 20 million one-acre farmers all over the world rise out of poverty. So now I want to tell you some stories about what I learned from this. 20 million do uh, customers uh, who live on a dollar a day is just a drop in the bucket as far as I'm concerned in, in the light of 2.6 billion customers for rising out of poverty. But the basic principles that we learned over those 25 years and what I've learned from personally interviewing 3,000 of those farmers and walking through their fields is directly applicable to business strategies and radically affordable technologies that serve these customers. So let me tell you a little bit about that experience over the past 25 years. 25 years ago, it's now closer to 30 years, I started an organization called International Development Enterprises. It's based on the principle of treating poor people as customers instead of as recipients of charity. We only delivered products at a fair market price that, were un that was unsubsidized. Um, we received some grant funds to help create the uh, volume business, but all of the products were sold at a fair market price with reasonable profits for the manufacturer of the technology, the village dealer, and the technician who installed it. In my book, Out of Poverty, I describe 12 practical steps for problem solving. The first three of those steps are the most important and they are embedded in IDE's genetic DNA and I think need to be embedded in any effort to develop successful, profitable businesses serving the 2.6 billion customers who live on less than $2 a day. <clears throat> the first three of these steps are go to where the action is, Talk to the people who have the problem and listen to what they have to say and learn everything there is to know about the specific context of the problem. You cannot design a transformative technology by sitting here in Mumbai. You have to go to the customers and learn about them. And when I talk about listening, I'm not talking about listening to the words, I'm talking about listening with your soul. Listening to the nonverbal communication. If you as an audience are worth your salt, from the very beginning of my talk, you applied the bullshit sniff test. You made a judgment about whether I'm, what I'm saying is likely to be true or not. And you're continuing to make that judgment as I speak. That judgment is not based on my words, it's based on nonverbal communication, and that's the most important thing you can learn about listening. Here's a perfect example of how this works in practice. In Bangladesh, some 15 years ago, USAID spent a lot of money encouraging small rice farmers to apply more fertilizer to their rice. They used a whole host of education ag extension and communication techniques and failed miserably. They were convinced that these small farmers were superstitious, uh, ignorant, and would never learn anything. And then finally, somebody from USA talked to a farmer and said, why aren't you using more fertilizer for your rice? And the farmer said, oh, that's simple. Every 10 years is a flood that wipes out everything we plant. We will not use any more fertilizer during the monsoon season than we can afford to lose in a 10-year flood. And all of a sudden, these poor, ignorant farmers became the teachers and the agricultural experts became the learners. Eventually, things like developing irrigation for the dry season when there was no risk of flooding, uh, then farmers used liberal applications of fertilizer that fit with the economic theory. So as I said before, everything that IDE is a nonprofit that operated though in business methods, 
It was based on treating poor people as customers instead of as recipients of charity. One of the first things, as Ulhaus said, that we were successful at is introducing the treadle pump. It's basically a bamboo stairmaster that lifts about a liter of water per second from up to five meters. And with it, a farmer can grow a half acre of vegetables in the dry season and earn $100. Treadle pump costs $8. Installed on a tube well, uh, it costs $25, including a profit for the manufacturer, the dealer, and the well driller. So what did we do to make this happen and bring it to scale? First, we recruited in Bangladesh some 75 manufacturers. These are little workshops with welding machines that cost about $2,500 in capital equipment. This is, I think, a Vietnamese uh, uh, entrepreneur uh, welding base plates on treadle pumps. You can see the regulation footwear that he's using. But this is a radical difference from normal standards of manufacturing. This is a Mahindra manufacturing operation. We then recruited some two to 3,000 village dealers in Bangladesh who sold a variety of things in addition to treadle pumps. You see some plastic treadle pumps here in front. Um, these uh, dealers earned a 12% margin on selling treadle pumps. And the critical thing was that they needed to sell at least 20 or 30 in a year to make it attractive to them financially. Compare this with one of your dealerships. I think this one is in the United States. We launched an education program. This is a uh, IDE staff member doing a farmer meeting in, in Zambia. And as Ulhaus mentioned, the problem we had with the treadle pump is that it was like a politician without name recognition. Nobody knew what a treadle pump was or what it does. In contrast to low-cost drip, people in India already know about what drip irrigation does. So we created a 90-minute Bollywood-type movie with the usual uh, characteristics of a Bollywood movie. We hired the top uh, screenwriter in Bangladesh, the top director, the top male lead, the top female lead. A 90-minute movie cost us about $25,000. The plot in the first movie was boy meets girl. They want to get married. They can't get married because the father doesn't have enough money for the dowry. So she falls into the clutches of a dowry bandit. Now in Bangladesh, a typical rural Bollywood type movie has a wedding, a funeral, a near suicide, and a great deal of singing and dancing. So in this case, the girl fell into the clutches of a dowry bandit, there was a near suicide, and at the climax of the movie, the movie stopped. And the 15 dealers that we invited to the meeting, who in turn had invited their top potential customers, got their customers up on recirculating treadle pumps and gave them a feel of what the merchandise operated like. Then the movie reserve, uh, resumed. The father met a childhood friend. And guess what? He told him about the treadle pump. So the father bought a treadle pump, made a lot of money, had enough money for the dowry. They got married and lived happily ever afterwards. That movie played to an audience of a million rural people a year in a typical open air setting. It was attended by three to 5,000 people and it had a major impact on generating sales. And it was important not just to have the movie, but to have a point of sale, to have the dealer talk to customers and have personal interaction using the movie as a platform to do that. There are a lot of things like that. Uh, the problem we had, of course, is that half of the farmers in rural Bangladesh were, couldn't read and write and had no access to media. Uh, uh, things have changed since then. Here's the kind of marketing materials that you produce now, which are uh, aimed at a different kind of uh, different income level of customer. After we sold some two million treadle pumps, we did the same thing for drip irrigation. Drip irrigation is one of the most efficient ways of delivering water uh, uh, to fields. You now, I think, have your own irrigation company. But unfortunately, and maybe tragically, 
only 1% of global irrigation is drip irrigation. It's because current drip irrigation systems are too big and too expensive to meet the needs of the majority of the world's farmers. 85% of the farms in the world today are under five acres. The average farm in the world is maybe two or three acres. The, the sweet spot in the market for drip irrigation is perhaps a quarter acre. That's simply not available from Jane or the other drip irrigation manufacturers. So uh, we developed a drip irrigation system that was smaller and about one third to one half of the cost. It costs less than the subsidized price of systems installed in India today. And in India, we've sold some three or 400,000 of those systems. But we've combined them with a, a pad package of, high, uh, of labor intensive, high value, off season cash crops, which enable farmers to increase their income by $1,000 a year from a quarter acre of intensive horticulture crops which, with the proper education, inputs, and access to markets. I believe every organization needs to operate with ongoing evaluation of their costs and impacts. So uh, here's a summary of the information about IDE's costs and impacts over the first 25 years. IDE is a nonprofit received contributions from individuals and foundations, uh, as well as grants from uh, USAID, the Swiss government, the German government, and the Canadian government. The total amount for the first 25 years, starting from scratch, was $78 million. Dollar a day, one acre farmers invested a total of $139 million over the same time period. And they are now earning $288 million a year in net income from their investment. Because the market serving $2 a day people and $1 a day people is totally a virgin market in most places, these kinds of returns are readily available in many areas. Not all of them can be profitable. The treadle pump, I don't think, can be marketed at a profit without some change in business strategy. But there are many technologies and business strategies that can be profitable. Three years ago, I handed over IDE to my successor, Al Dirksen, and I started two new organizations. The first is called Design Revolution. It's based in Silicon Valley, and it's, it's based on the principle that Pretty much all the designers in the world spend, today spend all their time designing products and services for the richest 10% of the world's customers. And it's time that that silly ratio be turned on its ear. So DREV is a design incubator for technologies for the other 90%. To me, design is a process of creative problem solving. Anybody in this room can do it. The first thing that people often don't realize in the design process is that you can choose problems at the very beginning that have scalable solutions. Instead of designing a product that proves useful to 100 or 1,000 customers, like this play pump that was developed in Africa, why not select a problem that can reach 100 million customers? There are many of these uh, problems that can be solved. I'll say a little bit about the principles of design. This has been adopted in many design schools now, including Stanford course, uh, Design for Extreme uh, Profitability at MIT, and we're creating a movement to create 100 of these schools in which multidisciplinary teams of students uh, design practical solutions uh, for key problems that are scalable. I think most of you in this room are familiar with this design process. It's no different than what you do all the time. It's important to set specific cost targets from the very beginning, carefully analyze what the tool does, identify the key contributors to cost, design around each cost point by finding acceptable trade-offs for the customers, 
And here I'll just mention, I'll tell a story about an example, drip irrigation. Drip irrigation for 50 acres requires long lateral lines with fairly high pressure so that the water uh, dripping at the end of the lateral line is the same as the water dripping at the beginning. If you're irrigating a field about as big as this stage, you don't need high pressure. So instead of high pressure, we take a 200 liter drum, put it on a, t uh, on a tabletop about this high, uh, and connect some lateral lines to it that reach the field. Now when you eliminate, you can pretty much predict the cost of any tool by weighing it. When you have long lateral lines at high pressure, the walls have to be thick. You can now make thin plastic sleeves. In fact, the farmers used Pepsi, though that sugar water, when they saw our first uh, thin walled lateral lines, and they used Pepsi, but they that didn't work because it, uh, it uh, disappeared after six weeks and it needs a longer life. So we took their innovation, made it a little bit bigger wall thickness, added some black, carbon black, and that drip system works uh, very well. Uh, so we dramatically decreased the wall thickness. We replaced uh, emitters with holes and microtubes. We replaced high-tech filters with simple filters that could be hand-washed on a regular basis. And the uh, uh, microtubes, when they plug, can easily be unplugged. This resulted in drip systems at one half or one third the cost. Uh, uh, some 300,000 farmers, small farmers, have bought them in India already. So design for me is a process of first going to where the action is, listening, then the standard designing a proof of concept prototype, but then very quickly you put the technology and the business strategy in the hands of the customers. You ask them what's wrong with it after having experience with it. You redesign it, put it in their hands again. If you move it from India to Africa, you go through that process again. A technology that goes through that process has a very high success rate. Here are some of the things that have come out of this process. The Stanford class on design for extreme affordability came up with a $25 uh, in premature infant incubator which can be used without electricity in rural clinics. Uh, normally those uh, incubators from the West cost three or four thousand um, dollars. Another team from Stanford uh, developed D-Lite, which you have an investment in. Um, here is the Remotion Knee, developed by a young group of, uh, group of young people at DREV, the uh, Silicon Valley-based uh, design firm that I started. That costs uh, $80. That's a retail cost with uh, a profit built in. So here's another miracle. I think I'll be done with my presentation early. So if you have any questions, I'll be glad to take them. But I want to wrap up by talking about these four new companies or business opportunities, each of which has the potential of reaching 100 million customers and generating 10 billion in revenues with attractive bottom line profits. And I'll give you some examples so you can see what I'm talking about. So here's an example in health, which is fairly straightforward. There are a billion, in the, a billion people in the world who need eyeglasses and don't have them today. 800 million of those need simple reading glasses. They have the middle age disease where you need arm extenders. Fully one half of the eyeglasses sold in the United States today are sold from self-selecting display racks in stores like Walmart at a very low price. You can buy very attractive, aspirational, and sturdy eyeglasses in mainland China for about 25 rupees in volume. All we would need to do, now some of these glasses are available in urban areas in India, but they're not available in the rural areas. If a farmer in Bihar is picking a, out a package of vegetable seeds and he can't read the package, he may plant the wrong vegetable seeds. All we would need to do 
is to buy, first of all, design those eyeglasses that are aspirational for rural farmers, uh, buy eyeglasses in volume in mainland China, set up a global distribution network and sell them for 100 rupees, making a reasonable profit, in uh, Karana shops all over India. We'd have to design an aspirational, attractive display rack for Karana shops. And here are the kind of impacts that that would generate. This is not rocket science. It's not equals, e equals mc squared. I've already talked about water. There are a billion people in the world who don't have access to safe drinking water. The kicker, if we are successful in creating this rural uh, network selling safe drinking water in Corona shops, is that the endemic need and customer demand for safe drinking water will basically pay for a last mile distribution system and then we can start introducing other radically affordable transformative products like a two rupee nutritious soft drink through the same distribution mechanism. Here are some of the potential impacts of that kind of water business. I'm talking about how all these things apply at a very practical level to Mahindra, or potentially to Mahindra. You already have, a leader, have established a leaders, uh, leadership system in photovoltaics, but your photovoltaic systems for the most part now sell to the 10% uh, type of customers. How could you bring solar energy to rural villages in a way that is profitable and scalable? Well, here's a simple technology that was also developed at DREV. It's much cheaper to concentrate, to develop a low-cost reflector that concentrates solar energy on a, on a solar strip than it is to add more PV cells. So we developed and tested a simple concentrator which took a two-watt strip of photovoltaic cells uh, focused eight suns of energy on it and got six suns out. We're now going to field test the same thing in Gujarat for a 1500 uh, watt system and see whether it is uh, appropriately scalable. If it's scalable, it should cut the, co uh, the functional cost of PV electricity for rural areas by 30 to 50 percent. Whatever the cost of the current PV is, it will cut the cost. It requires designing a sturdy, non-trackable solar concentrator. And here are the kind of impacts that can come from that. At an even bigger scale in the energy field, coal in the world represents 40% of carbon emissions. There are 6 billion tons of coal burned each year. 70% of your electricity in India comes from burning coal, and it's a fairly low quality coal. At the same time, recently, utility, large utilities in Europe are faced with the requirement of lowering their carbon footprints. So they have invested at an early stage $200 million just in Canada in, in the timber byproducts industry. This $200 million builds plants that convert sawdust and bark and timber waste materials into an early pyrolysis stage product. It's called torrefaction. And torrefied briquettes can be burned alongside of coal in European utility plants with no capital investment. So the cost of torrefied materials, uh, torrefied briquettes right now in Europe is $200 a ton. Now at the same time, there are 4 billion tons a year of agricultural waste products grown each year. It's possible to transform groundnut shells coconut husks, water hyacinth, into torrefied briquettes. 
and produce a form of green charcoal or green coal. The advantage of burning this material is that because of the carbon cycle, the plant takes the carbon from the atmosphere and when you release it with very little smoke, you have zero carbon emissions compared with burning coal. I, uh, these torrefaction plants in the US and Canada cost start, the cost starts at $10 million. But the process is very simple. It involves heating dried uh, plant material to a temperature of about 280 degrees in the absence of oxygen and leaving it there for about three hours. That's about the same temperature you use to bake a chicken. I think it's possible to design a torrefaction plant in a village where the huge constraint is the transport cost of bringing the raw material. But I was just in Arissa and there are thousands of bullock carts hauling rice straw. So if you put a plant like this in a village and design it, I think we can design it for $10,000, it will generate over $100,000 in marketable products at each village, create six jobs, and if we are able to recapture 100 million tons out of the 4 billion tons, that's a $10 billion company with profound contribution to climate change improvement. These are just examples. There are many, many others. Much of the uh, agricultural waste now is burnt in the fields. And here's what torrified pellets look like. And here are some of the impacts of that potential business. So I have talked to you today about my dream that Mahindra could rise over the next 10 years to a company with $100 billion in sales. Mahindra could help raise 500 million $2 a day people out of poverty and make attractive profits doing it. How much of this $100 billion in sales will come from creating new businesses serving the 2.6 billion bypassed customers who live on less than $2 a day? I leave the answer to that question up to you. Thank you very much. Paul is happy to take some questions, so does anybody have any questions to ask him? Yes, Paul. I just want to say two words, thank you. You're very welcome. A question from my side for Paul. Yeah. Over here. Ulas, yeah, please, side. please. To the right. Uh, to your right, Paul. That's me over here. Oh, yeah, okay, here hi. we are. Hi, how are you? Thank you. Paul, this was a very impressive and absolutely fascinating work you are doing. And really, I'm very much impressed. I had the agribusiness, so you can understand my excitement about what you just said. And clearly, what you said makes a lot of sense and is very much in line with our vision of farm tech prosperity. But uh, coming to the question, we see a lot of wastage happening, Paul, in terms of the post-harvest, especially in India, because of lack of storage facilities, the cold chain. So have you done some work in that? Do you have some thoughts on how we can have low-cost storage solutions for farmers, in addition to what you said? I want to make sure I understand the question. You're talking about low-cost storage or low-cost low cost post? Cold storage. Cold storage. Cold storage. Well, let me say a little bit about cold storage as it applies to the village. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, farmers in Nigeria bring their lettuce and vegetables to market, but the market is very hot and many of the vegetables like lettuce wilts. A creative entrepreneur in Nigeria developed a pot in pot method. Mm -hmm. It basically uses a traditional form of pottery that has, uh, that's very porous and it p takes a smaller pot, puts it inside a larger pot and puts some sand that is wet in between. With the cooling from the evaporation of that sand, of, of the water in that sand, lettuce will wilt. It takes eight hours for lettuce to wilt instead of two. That makes a profound impact. He's sold quite a large number of those systems. They cost five to ten dollars. They start at five oh. to ten dollars. Um, I think that there are a number of things for people growing vegetables that can help them uh, cool the vegetables on the way to market, but that are not expensive. For instance, you can uh, dig a pit in the ground and put the vegetables in a, in a safe container in that pit. You can develop collection systems that, uh, simple systems before you get to refrigeration that uh, take a, uh, something like a metal box, cover it with uh, bag material, and drip irrigate the bag material while you're pulling it on a bicycle to get it to refrigerate it. You see what I mean? There are many, many uh, opportunities for things like this. It just hasn't been worked on very much. Uh, in addition, there are a host of opportunities for post-harvest processing that are profoundly uh, positive for rising poor small farmers. For example, the whole line of essential oil products. India is the biggest uh, producer of, uh, of, of uh, lemongrass. Mm -hmm. Lemongrass deteriorates very quickly and it's quite bulky. If you designed a $1,500 fairly efficient steam distillation system that could be applied close to the farm, it would have profound positive effects on the income of small farmers. Does that give you an idea of uh, the kind of opportunities that oh, exist? Yes. Oh yes, Paul, and I think I'm going to meet you after this and be in touch with you because you have very good ideas and we really require those ideas to help our farmers in India. Thank you very okay, much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Yes, please. <clears throat> yeah. My question is, uh, you know, sometimes, most of the time we, we try to do something like this listening to the customer, capturing the voice of the customer is, is uh, the most difficult part of it. So we, we go there with some uh, preconceived notions and a questionnaire, if you will, and, and try to fit in what he is saying to um, our questionnaire. How do you normally start the process of understanding the needs around solar, around energy, any of these? Okay, uh, I think that's a very clear question and it's a very good one, thank you. <clears throat> you have done some work, for instance, in housing. If you're going to do housing in slums, improved housing in slums, the first thing is to go to the slums, talk to the people, look at their current housing, ask them what they're willing and able to pay for and what they, what they need. Here's my approach, it's very basic. I go to a village and I never go without a trusted, respected person from that local culture as my introducer. I'll spend a week in a village, a little bit less than a week. I'll start with one fairly typical family in that village and I'll spend seven hours with that family. First, it's important to make friends to establish a relationship. I have a crazy sense of humor. Sometimes people don't understand me, cross-culture, but anyway, I make a connection. In the course of that seven hours, I ask everything about their lives, depending on when they're comfortable enough to share. I ask them what they ate for breakfast. I ask them how far their kids went to school and why. I ask them what they feed their dog, if they have a dog. I ask them when they're comfortable about all of their sources of income, not just from farming, but from off-farm labor or anything else that they do. 
I ask them how they spend their money, so I have a really in-depth understanding of that family. Then I interview another seven families in that village for an hour or two. At the end of that period, which takes a few days, I have never yet spent a few days doing this in a village without coming up with at least one transformative technology or business that could reach a large number of people. So that's the basic approach, but it takes going there and listening and not having preset conditions. I went to some villages in the central hills of Vietnam once. This is an example. This is a group of tribal people who had no written language. I went there to see if we could market drip irrigation systems that could help them grow black pepper, oranges, and some other high value crops. When I was talking to them, we met in the house of a chief with several village families. I asked them what was going on. The women said that they were devastated. They had invested loans that they got from the government in raising pigs and most of the pigs died and they couldn't pay back the loan and they were full of shame. So I asked them why the pigs died and they didn't know. So on the spot, I put up $150 to bring a vet from Hanoi. Turns out that pigs had pig cholera and nobody wanted to talk about it because that would be bad for business. But more than that, what normally happened is that these tribal people grew pigs that were delivered from the plains. The farmers who produced pigs put a pig, piglet on a bike and a motorbike, sent it up to the village, but they usually sold the runt of the litter or a pig that was diseased anyway. IDE ended up creating a pig rearing operation in the hills, which has become very lucrative. And now suckling pigs are being sold from these tribal villages to customers in the plains. I didn't expect that. It simply was a big problem. And so we dealt with it. Do you see what I mean? It's a, it's, there's a, the most important thing is to not go with preset things and to really listen. Does that give you an idea? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, May man. I? Hey, man. Sorry. Um, Paul, uh, you passed my bullshit smell test within your first few sentences that you uttered. uttered. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, <laughs> But um, since you have been evangelizing about this whole process um, for some time, are you satisfied with which, the way with which other Mahindras in the world have adopted this? And if not, what do you think is holding them back? And if you are satisfied, tell us. If you're not satisfied, tell us why. Excellent question. I am not at all satisfied, but in fairness, I've only been, uh, you know, the biggest problem in development today is achieving scale. 20 million farmers that we helped is a drop in the bucket. It's, it's a nice achievement, people say congratulations, but it's a drop in the bucket compared with 2.6 billion. I think the only way to reach 2.6 billion is by releasing market forces, and big business has to take a leadership role in doing it. I have now begun to talk with uh, uh, several corporations and there's a, I'm amazed at the level of interest. But this is a field in its infancy and not much has been done. And the reason is that conventionally, multinational corporations don't believe you can make a profit from serving poor customers. In my view, corporate social responsibility is for the most part cosmetic and done for good PR. Uh, although there are some exceptions. Um, I don't think most big businesses have a clue about how to design radically affordable products that can meet the needs of these customers. It really, uh, so often what corporations try to do is make cosmetic changes to their current product line and try to sell it to poor people and that doesn't work. You have to generate a revolution in how you design price, uh, market, and distribute your products. I don't think, I think that's too big a challenge for most corporations. So this is at its early stage, 
I am going to spend the rest of my life developing large international businesses for profit and I believe that corporations will come in when we can demonstrate attractive profitability doing this. So that's what I'm working on. I'm not satisfied, but in fairness, this is very early and I'm amazed at the level of interest on the part of organizations like Procter & Gamble, uh, Cummins Engine, because many of these businesses are seeing, you know, Procter & Gamble is trying to increase the percentage of their customers in uh, emerging markets. Unilever is ahead of them. Cummins already, their market for engines is comparatively flat. This is published data in the US. Uh, they have a negative growth rate in the US. Their growth rate in China, India, and Brazil is something like 70%. Their profit picture in the US is less than 5%. Their profit, uh, bottom line profits in India and China are 12%. This is clearly pointing the direction, but big diesel engines don't sell to the bottom of the pyramid. I believe that the next generation of, this is a virgin area and it's waiting to be, uh, uh, virgin markets are waiting to be created and I think they can be profitable at scale, but I'm not satisfied. That's a short answer to your question. Thank you. Uh, one question. Yeah. May I? Yeah. One of the projects that the group is working on, Paul, uh, to your left, way behind. Oh, okay. Right, last bench, actually. Thank you. One of the projects the group is working on is in uh, a group of 32 villages to bring holistic uh, development to the villagers who stay there, from making water available to improving agriculture to health, education, and hygiene. Now, how could we take some of the things that you've presented today, which are obviously effective, to that area and try our hands at it so that, if possible, we can make a business out of it. And if you were to choose to visit that area, the honor would be all ours, because I'm sure you'll give us some lovely ideas on what else we could do there. Thank you, that's a very interesting question. I'll answer that with a question back to you. Are, is your basic pro approach a charitable approach where you give things to these people or are you trying to establish scalable needs that can be met profitably by delivering products and services to them as customers? The second. Then I think that the opportunities are endless but you have to, uh, I would have to go there and learn more about what you're doing to give you an idea of what I think about it. Wonderful. I'd be happy to share the work with you. I come to India four times a year working on this water project and as you can imagine, I'm a little bit overcommitted. I'm still putting in 80 hours a week and that is no problem because I have uh, I'm blessed with a lot of energy, but uh, uh, I have uh, some limitations on my time. But if I can squeeze it in somehow, I'd be glad to help. Yeah, Paul. Please. Here. Uh, the question is, uh, you talked about sustainability. Many of the things you have been doing have been amazing. Now, how do you then follow through in the sense after five years, after three years, whether they are working and these people, uh, life has been lifted up, the point which you made. So how do you make it sustainable? What, what mechanism do you have to measure them later? Well, first of all, if it's going to be sustainable, it has to be profitable. You have in India hundreds of thousands of hand pumps installed in villages, which nobody owns but the government or UNICEF or some organization, they have a 50 to 70% breakdown rate. Treadle pumps, if you visit them uh, two years later, have a 93% operating rate. It's because they are used to form income and because they're owned by people. Um, we always use independent impact assessment. So in, uh, in, uh, with the water project as an example, I'm astonished with a profusion of water projects in India that nobody is measuring the level of pathogen infestation of water that people are drinking. We start with that. We do water melas in the village. People are very interested in having us test their water. 
We test it for E. coli. We do random tests in the house of people's water to see if it's safe because 60% of the contamination is between a pure source and the actual household. Um, we do tests for chlorine residual half an hour after we treat the water in the tank. Um, I'm not sure how to explain it, but, but you have to have objective measures, but you have to apply radical affordability. The E. coli test that we did for the beta test came from uh, import. We imported the material, the agar media, and, and the Petri dishes. It costs uh, $7 a test. That's not affordable. So we have uh, brought that down to 50 cents. Now we can do those tests as a marketing strategy because it generates customers. Because when a woman and a man, there's a difference between talking theoretically and bringing a sample of your water and seeing these colonies. You're supposed to have less than two. And many of these sources are just pink with hundreds of E. coli colonies. That's much more personal, but that's also a way of evaluating. When we sell treadle pumps, we do independent surveys of sales. We give guarantee cards. Uh, I heard part of the talk before mine. Uh, quality is very important, so we give guarantee cards. So we have an address for everybody with a treadle pump, and if it doesn't work, we'll send somebody out to fix it. So it's really important to understand and to follow up and to measure. So we have. Uh, we, for instance, contracted for an independent uh, socioeconomic impact study of the treadle pump carried out by uh, IMI, the International Irrigation Organization. And uh, they are the ones that said that my estimates of a farmer buying a treadle pump for $25 and earning $100 a year net from it was, were conservative. So it, if this can be built in, then it doesn't have to be terribly expensive. Paul, a question here. So, okay, I, we, we're running out of time, so Just, maybe uh, you, you'll have yeah, an yeah. opportunity to talk to him uh, after the, uh, you know, in the breaks or something. We can only take 500 more questions. <laughs> okay, so Paul, well, thank you very much thank for you. this inspiring speech, and we have a small token of our appreciation. Thank you, thank you very much.